Okay, I'm going to get started. We only have 30 minutes. Um, welcome to all of you to this CCL Academy trade-based money laundering um, webinar. Um, and I want to just welcome you with, with uh, open arms because this is a very important topic and we have an enormous amount to get through in 30 minutes. Um, you, have, uh, you will see that we have some slides. I'm gonna go through some of these very quickly and linger on others, depending on where I think the focus should be. Um, just to let you know, there is you should be able to see a Q and A option at the bottom of your screen. If you have any questions, please, as I'm going through this, please put them in there. I will try and pick them off as I'm talking. I will keep an eye on them, and um, we will talk. I will try and answer those as we go through. Forgive me if we don't have time to do that, um, but I will do my best. So let's get cracking. Uh, my name is Bruce Viney, um, and I've been with CCL Academy now for about three years. Please keep your microphones muted um, and we will get going. So trade-based money laundering is a huge subject. As you all know, trade-based trade money laundering is massive. And what most regulators are saying, this is, slide is taken from uh, the FCA's uh, thematic review on uh, 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 trade-based money laundering is seven years old, but it doesn't matter. A lot of them, if you look at uh, the DFSA, for example, saying the same thing three years later. Um, that most banks are actually not managing their trade-based money laundering risk properly. They're just simply not doing the right kind of work. They're not seeing it as a separate risk, separate set of uh, risks for uh, money laundering. Um, and they need to train their people better. So much more requirement around training people who are involved in trade finance to understand what the specific risks are for uh, trade. And they are very specific. Um, and so we need to think about doing these things properly. You need to think about it for your own firm as well. Trade-based money laundering is massive. I mean, look wherever you want to do. If you look at the bottom of the screen, FATF 14 years ago was talking about how big this is. Um, and then you've got the ICC global survey in 2018 saying it's even more uh, enormous. It is just huge and complex. Trade is growing all the time. If you look at the graph for the growth of, growth of trade, it's significant. COVID hasn't really stopped that. Um, COVID has changed things to some extent, but it nonetheless, it has helped uh, trade to carry on just as it normally does. There's been no real challenge. The way trade-based money laundering is managed can vary from the simple to the very, very complicated. And this example in front of you now is quite a well-known example. It's about 10 years old. Um, and I will just talk you through this briefly. This was an example of drug dealers in Colombia um, selling drugs in the US. And the thing is when, when people like Colombian drug dealers sell drugs in the US, they end up with dollars, which they don't really want. They want Colombian pesos. So they use trade to launder that money, to commingle it, and in fact, diverting it to Hezbollah for terrorist purposes. So how this works in its simplest form is people are based in America, in the USA, who are part of this. They are given funds to buy secondhand cars. Secondhand cars are then shipped from the US to, uh, the, to um, West Africa, typically to Benin, was very common. Once those cars are there, they're housed in large car parks and then sold. This produces money, which is then passed up to the banks that are involved, which were the Lebanese Canadian Bank, Hassan Nayash Exchange Company, and the Lisa Exchange Company, and others indeed. So the money goes up to them. Those proceeds that were also, are also mixed up with legitimate business that's going on in Africa and Europe and other, other parts of the world. And this is one of the challenges for trade-based money laundering, that it is very easy to mix dirty money with clean money. So legitimate money, legitimate uh, businesses can be used to include dirty money. And then that money in this case went up to these exchange houses, these banks. Some of that money is diverted to Hezbollah. Some of that money goes back to the Colombian drug lords, but as uh, pesos, not as dollars. This is not that, not as complicated as it looks. There's far more complicated ones. This is what uh, a type of black market peso exchange model. Now, I'll show you a simplified version of this later on, but it is one of the most common models for trade-based money laundering. So you need to be alert to this. And it revolves around the need to convert dollars into another currency. 
Now, one of the things uh, with trade is you have a lot of parties involved and you have a lot of parties that you need to be thinking about. It. Who are you dealing with in your trade? Who is involved and what is the role of your organization in that trade? Now, this slide is a very simplified version of that. And you have simply here a buyer of goods, a seller of goods, an issuing bank and an advising bank. Simple as that. Now, um, sellers can be called beneficiaries or exporters. Buyers can be applicants or importers. Doesn't really matter. But this is just a simple process. If you imagine the buyer approaches the issuing bank and is, is buying from our seller and wants a letter of credit so that the seller has confidence that they will be paid. So they go to the issuing bank and apply for uh, a documentary letter of credit. Now the issuing bank at that point has to decide where they're going to carry out due diligence or well, certainly on the buyer. But the issuing bank is also told that there's an advising bank involved. So they will notify the advising bank that it's been issued. What kind of CDD do they do on the advising bank? Well, that will depend on its relationship. If it's a correspondent banking relationship, which is already established, there's a lot less work to do than if it's a new relationship. And this isn't a customer relationship. So how do you manage that? And then the advising bank, of course, has been approached by the seller to act as its advising bank. So again, the questions are for the advising bank, what kind of CDD do you carry out on your seller? Is it a customer? Might not even be a customer. So again, you need to think about all these different relationships when you are looking at your involvement in trade. Goods are shipped, documents are then the documents of title, the commercial documents, the shipping documents sent to the advising bank. And the advising bank checks that these are in accordance with the requirement of the documentary credit. Um, the documents are then sent back to the issuing bank, payment goes out and everything revolves around that. Now, of course, this is very simplified. You can have third parties involved in this. Um, you can have other buyers, other sellers. You can have manufacturers. You can have different types of letters of credit. We don't have time to go through all of those. But what I want to stress to you here is be very clear in your own mind. What role are you and your organization taking in a particular trade? Who are your customers? Who else do you need to screen or carry out degrees of CDD on? It's really important you get that fixed in your mind. You understand, understand how to assess the risks as well. Lots of reasons why people abuse the global trade system. Here's a list here. I'm not going to read them all out, but you can see tax evasion is actually a big one. Um, sanctions, of course, are huge. Um, corruption and bribery is actually almost an enabler of trade based money laundering and vice versa. They kind of go hand in hand uh, with criminality. So you could think of uh, corrupt peps, for example, carrying out uh, trade based money laundering to support their corruption. We'll talk about dual use goods in a minute. But the biggest problem we have is we only deal in documents. We don't deal in goods, do we? So we don't go out and see the goods. We are looking at the documents. So for us, we lack transparency. We are being relying on what we're told about goods. We're relying on what we're told about shipment. We're allowing or relying on what we're told about discharge and loading. All of these things we, we have in documentary evidence. We don't have anything else. And there are lots of ways that we can be hidden from what's actually going on. Now, correspondent banking, I already mentioned that in that example, this is a big part of trade finance and correspondent banking brings its own risks and it's a subject all of its own. Um, but it, correspondent banking is and has been for some time seen as a very high risk activity. A lot of banks are de-risking from correspondent banking. And the reason for that, of course, is if you are the blue correspondent bank, and you have a respondent bank, you effectively have some degree of exposure to the customers of the respondent bank. Now, obviously, that's going to vary depending on what your deal is with the respondent bank. But you need to be aware that you do not have visibility to their customers. Now, there's lots of ways of managing that risk, um, including working with the respondent bank to make sure they have good controls, uh, good CDD, that their staff are fully trained and so on. But when you're dealing with your risks in the, the whole train around trade finance, then please, if you're dealing in a correspondent respondent banking relationship, consider the risks that exist there because they are highly significant. May I remind you, if you want to ask any questions, please use the Q&A box at the bottom of your screen. I will try and pick those up as we go through. I can't see any popping up just yet, but I will if you want to put any in there. 
good. So we need to risk assess, obviously, just like any other part of money laundering, we need to assess the risk of what we're dealing with here. So what about our customer? Who is our customer? Now, if you think about that relationship that we saw earlier, the issuing bank, the bank that's issuing the letter of credit, are we the advising bank? Are we advising the uh, seller on the uh, letter of credit? And are we passing documents back to the issuing bank? Are we a confirming bank or, a, or a, a notifying bank? There's lots of different roles we could play in here. We need to understand what risks those belong. What does our customer do? Are they dealing in high risk goods? Are they dealing in high risk jurisdictions? Um, and so on. And you also need to think about once you've assessed your risk, is there anything that would change that risk? And are you alert to that? If we're thinking about sanctions, sanctions, um, is a massive area of risk for us, it really is. Sanctions are getting more complicated, they're getting more diverse. There are far more sanctions out there than there were even 18 months ago. There's an exponential growth. Um, the, the EU and the US are going different ways, for example, on sanctions to do with Iran. So sanctions are a massive challenge that we need to be aware of. And the way people try and evade sanctions are multiples, of course. But for example, they might lie to you about the type of cargo. So the documents might say it's one type of cargo and it's actually another type of car cargo. Or they might really be quite vague about where the, where the uh, cargo is being picked up or discharged or not telling you about visits to ports and sanctioned countries, hiding the beneficial owners, um, or if there's a payment beneficiary, they might be a sanctioned person, even if they're not based in a sanctioned country. So it's very important for us that we think about these things. You know, they might be dealing in weapons or rough diamonds or even simple things like the provision of higher education in certain sciences, which themselves might be subject to sanctions. And although screening is very important, we can't just rely on screening because screening will not pick up everything. So I would say this to you, if you're in compliance, if you're in operations, or if you're in the front end dealing with your customers, all of you need to be alert to sanctions risk because it's a big risk around trade finance. So please don't take it lightly. Don't think it's something that's, oh, that's fine. It's all dealt with, with screening. It's not all dealt with with screening. So um, other things they might do very quickly, they might, uh, change the details about payments, who's being paid, where they're being paid, how much they're being paid. Um, they might change the documents, the shipping documents um, or the routing, anything like that. Keep an eye open for documentation that is internally inconsistent. You know, as you many of you will know, one of the most important things you're trying to do is assess whether the documents you have been given, the commercial documents, the shipping documents, the title documents and others are all internally consistent and do they match the requirements in the letter of credit? Because if they don't, then you have a problem. So that's one of the key things. And it's frankly embarrassing if you miss those. So make sure you're looking out for those. Be alert in your own mind and think, do these make sense? Do they add up? Now, dual use goods, as many of you will know, are a big challenge in, in trade based money laundering. Dual use goods are simply goods that have two at least two possible uses, one of which may be entirely innocent, the other one might be related to military or other activity. Very simple example would be a circuit chip that goes in your microwave uh, and cooks your dinner for you might also go into the guidance system of a cruise missile. The problem with dual use goods is that understanding when they are being used for the illegal use is extremely difficult. Um, some examples of standard dual use goods include very innocent sounding things like fertilizer, chlorine, um, aluminum alloys, pipes, those kind of things, very innocent sounding things. And we need to be alert to when they're actually being shipped to the wrong, for the wrong reason. So here are some of the things you can be thinking about when you're dealing with dual use goods. Is someone trying to hide what the end use of these goods is for, or even the end user. Is there a forwarding address involved? Is there something funny about the packaging? Um, is the part, is the, either the person you're dealing with or one of their partners located in an area under strict security? And do remember, by the way, that dual use goods can include um, services like training and others. Um, so dual use goods is huge. So too is proliferation finance. Um, Proliferation finance is linked to dual use goods in the sense that this is about providing finance for 
uh, weapons of mass destruction, fundamentally. And it is civil and dual use goods that it's quite hard to identify, but it's very important. And if you look at the FATF paper on this, you'll see why they consider it so important. So please remember the importance of dual use goods and proliferation finance. And I'm sure your organizations will, each of you will have your own lists of possible dual use goods. Um, lots of ways that people might um, manage uh, trade-based money laundering. And it's usually around transfer of value. So some of the very common ones are to do with under and over invoicing. So invoicing more than the goods are actually worth or less. And a link to that could be short or over shipping, shipping less than you declare on the documents or more than you declare. Why would you do that? Well, you're transferring value. It's a clear transfer of value. Um, sometimes you have multiple invoicing invoicing so the same goods but invoiced over and over and over again watch out for things like repeating numbers and that kind of things the invoice numbers and u-boating um, is a type of system which involves uh, the purchase of genuine goods from a perfectly legitimate company substituting those goods for counterfeit goods sending them back to the original seller as returns um, you now have the original goods you sell the original goods one of uh, someone who's uh, working with you in the original seller sells the counterfeit goods. The advantage of the counterfeit goods, by the way, is customs never open returns. That's very, very quick on um, you voting because I just want to speed up a little. Um, on this slide, you can read this at, at your leisure, but these are lists of examples of ridiculous pricing um, that have real ones. So uh, plastic buckets being sold for nearly $1,000 a unit, nonsense. Um, bulldozers being uh, exported at $1.75 a unit and so on. Um, the, the, there are all sorts. The uh, wheelchair and the motorbike there is there because uh, one, one shipping attempt was shipping what was declared as wheelchair gears, wheel, wheelchair gearboxes. Um, and the people involved in, the, in, in financing the deal did a simple back of the envelope check and realized that this was being shipped to Lagos and if Lagos needs that many uh, gearboxes for electric wheelchairs, then that would mean the entire population of Lagos was in wheelchairs. Nonsense, of course. What these actually were were motorbike uh, gearboxes that attracted higher import duties. It was an attempt to get around that. Now, I've left you, I've put here lots of different red flags um, uh, around customers, transactions, shipping, and so on. I haven't got time to read all of these out, but customer red flags for trade are very similar to red flags for customers anywhere else. So if they're deviating from what they normally do or their big change in volume or value of what they're trying to do, um, or they're not cooperating around providing documents, all of those are gonna be red flags. And that's, you should recognize those as red flags in trade uh, in money laundering uh, anyway, um, and there are a lot more of those. Um, as far as document red flags, the list here is enormous potentially, but obviously any discrepancies. So if you've got a discrepancy between the bill of lading and the invoice, then obviously that's a problem you want to find out about that. If the shipping location is different from the shipping location named in the letter of credit, again, you want to find out why. Now changes happen, people change things, but you need to always follow those through. Um, many years ago, someone presented documents when I was working, which included uh, references to a sanctioned country. Um, once they realized they'd sent us the documents with this uh, reference to the sanctioned country, they rang us up and said, sorry, we sent you the wrong documents. Can we you know, send you another set of documents that don't mention the sanctioned country? No, too late. We found you out. Uh, if you think any third party documents have been altered, be very alert to that. Be careful. Think about things like, you know, do the container numbers match the standards for container numbers? Do they actually match how they're supposed to be set up? If you've got your prefix and your, your, your suffix right, are they correct? If your bill of lading is, is vague and saying that, look, we don't know who this is good, these goods are going to be consigned to, they'll be consigned to um, when we decide. Well, that's nonsense. Don't have a switch bill of lading. Don't have a future dated bill of lading. So all of these are significant red flags and there are loads more. I mean, there really are. Um, anything that's unusual, anything that doesn't match the UCP standards, um, anything that looks like um, customs have already said no, but has been tried to push through. So there's lots of things about documents, but above all, look for consistency, look for anything being tampered, 
look for anything relating to sanctioned countries or sanctioned goods. Keep alert to these things. It's a real art form getting this right. Then around transactions, there's a whole range of things that you might um, want to consider. Unnecessary complexity is always a problem from a money laundering point of view, um, uh, as would be offshore shipments. Now, in this case, what we mean by an offshore shipment would be a shipment between a buyer and a seller in the same country, but for reasons unknown to us, the shipment goes offshore. So imagine uh, there's a buyer and a seller on the east coast of the US, but the shipment goes to um, the Bahamas and back again. But we have no reason why. You definitely want to know why. If you've got lots of intermediaries you don't expect, you need to deal with them, um, find out why they're there. Uh, and of course, consider on a risk basis what you should be doing in terms of screening, in terms of any due diligence, in terms of adverse media checks. Don't ignore them. Don't just think that's nothing to do with us. If you have, for example, a seller who is selling goods that they are taking from a manufacturer and you're providing the letter of credit to the buyer for that seller, think about, well, can I ignore that manufacturer or do I have to bring that into my due diligence and consider it? And this is on a risk basis. Um, where you've got big amendments to uh, letters of credit or you've got in there non-standard clauses, clauses that are not part of the UCP standards. Um, things like they're unconditional, divisible or assignable, you know, no, sorry, they should be irrevocable. Um, uh, if they require uh, odd things like um, I've seen once where it said um, we require proof that these goods were not obtained uh, through crime. And that's such a weird statement. You're going to pick that up. Um, and carousel transactions, which is the repeated import and export of the same commodity, usually a high value commodity, just to generate uh, value flow. Again, you need to watch out for that. And then um, payment red flags. So red flags around payments, again, a lot. Changes, of course, last minute changes, you always need to know why. If you've got a third party involved, it doesn't seem to make sense. Might be um, if you've got business going on between, let's say, China and Turkey, you've got a shipment from China to Turkey, and suddenly you're asked to pay to somebody in Afghanistan. I'm just picking countries at random. You would want to know why. Um, definitely want to know why or if, for example, the payments were excessive or seemed excessive. I remember seeing a, someone being told they were going to, or the documentation said that they would receive a 33% commission. That's too high. Nobody gets 33%. So you want to find out why. Um, unusual trigger point for payment. For example, if, you, if it says we will pay before the goods are received. We will pay on dispatch, not on receipt, perhaps. Again, odd, and you want to know why. Or again, uh, you're looking at trans uh, currencies that are not usually used. And then with shipment red flags, um, think about, again, common sense. Are people shipping stuff that is just too much for the containers they say they're using? Are they shipping, I don't know, uh, 60 square meters of goods that they say is going to fit into a, a 40 square meter container? Doesn't make sense. Or does the shipment just look weird? Um, there's a famous one of a shipment from of scrap copper from China to New York, uh, which just looks strange. You, the, the question that people asked was, why was why is New York importing scrap copper from China? In fact, with that particular trade, of course, it, the, the, the pricing was wrong as well, because it was priced at good quality copper, not scrap copper. So does it make common? Does it common sense? Are the weights and measurements consistent with good shipped? And think about this, you know, a lot of goods, you know what they should weigh. So if somebody is, in, is importing a, a certain amount of steel, check the weight, check it against public documents. You can see if that is an appropriate weight for that amount of steel. Um, so lots and lots of red flags, lo loads more on that. But let's move on because of time. So uh, I mentioned the black market peso exchange model. This is the simplified version of it. And if you if you do nothing else today, take this with you and think about it, um, because this is what so many of them are based on. And it's the same problem I talked about at the beginning. It's drug dealers in Colombia selling drugs in America, getting US dollars that they don't want. In this example, the sort of core example, they go to a peso broker who pays them pesos for their dollars. So the drug dealers are happy they've got the pesos. Peso broker's not happy. He's got dollars, but he's a peso broker, not a dollar broker. So he wants pesos. What does he do? He takes those dollars and pays them into the US banking system. Now he does that through a process called smurfing. 
which means breaking it down into small amounts so it goes well below the $10,000 uh, trigger point for US banking. Um, the, the broker now looks for uh, somebody in Colombia who is importing something from the US. And in this case, he finds a, a grain importer and he offers to pay the grain importer's seller in the US using his dollars, which he does. And the uh, Colombian buyer pays the peso broker in pesos. So now we have that complete reset that the pesos are with the peso broker and the dollars are back with the uh, um, drug dealers. A lot more to say about that, but I won't for now. Um, tax evasion is a big area that of uh, challenge for um, us when we're dealing with trade-based money laundering, trade finance. Um, it is a huge area. There's a lot of advantages to uh, companies shipping from high tax to low tax and playing around with, with values of those kind of things. So be alert to tax evasion. You see some of the red flags there on that screen. Um, look for the, it's the volume of trade flows that makes this possible. It's the complexity that makes it possible. And the kind of things to look at here, use of shell companies, front companies are very common. Uh, registrations and tax havens that don't make business sense, uh, and so on. I'm not going to read those out. You can see those basically for yourself. And I want to leave you finally with some uh, examples of good practice. Um, this comes from, uh, again, from the uh, Financial Conduct Authority in the UK. Um, the reason I'm quite happy to quote that is because regulators are saying this is the same all over the world. Make sure that you identify um, the identification of trade-based money laundering risk as a separate issue in your policies and procedures. Make sure you get evidence for the whole, all the transactions, who's involved and how you manage that. Um, make sure that your staff really understand international trade and the trade-based money laundering, trade-based terrorist financing risks, the sanctions risks that go with that. Make sure people are properly trained in what they're doing. I'm, I'm finding there's a big increase in people asking for training around trade-based money laundering. And I'm doing a lot of it at the moment. And I think that's because people are seeing the high level of risk that is, is attendant on this. Um, the, for those of you who are, are involved in reviewing transactions, particularly ones that have been escalated, make sure you have the knowledge to do that. And again, that's training, that's experience. Look at the documentation, make sure it's consistent, make sure it's up to date, check the pricing wherever you can. And if it's not formally marketed, find another way of checking it. Make sure that anyone involved in trade finance in your organization understands the risks, whether that's compliance personnel, front office operations, or anybody else. Make sure they fully understand the risks of what they're working with. Too often, this has been made a secondary thing. Look, you've got a broad understanding of anti-money laundering, you're good for trade finance. No, that's totally wrong. I, can't, I really can't remember how many times I've heard that, but it's far too many times. So make sure that you understand what the red flags are and that you could escalate those and identify them and seek information on those as well. Think about sanctions risk and what that means uh, as well for you. What does that mean in terms of identifying sanctions risk? Trade is very open to that. Don't forget fraud. Fraud is a big part of trade-based uh, activities as well. Um, fraud is another problem for you. You don't want to be involved in financing a fraudulent transaction. So be alert. Uh, one example, uh, uh, just before I finish, is a famous case where a particular company was performing very well at a time when that the business of that company was in, the industry was going through the floor. In other words, that company was significantly outperforming the industry in which it operated. It took a while, but eventually someone asked the question why, and when they did, they started to dig and they found out there was a huge set of carousel transactions generating fictitious income and fraudulent income as well as fictitious in income and generating fictitious profits, which was gaining investment for other people, clear fraud. So be alert to that. And then my last slide, uh, basic reminders, know your customers and know who your customers are. But remember for trade, it's bigger than just your customers. Who are the parties? Look out for red flags. Make sure you know what the red flags are likely to be and look out for them. Screen everything, screen every transaction, but remember that screening is not enough for sanctions checking. It all goes on here. Um, know the end use you can put to things. Uh, that's around dual use goods and other things. Thank you, Mike. Um, and know the destination where things are going. Check any licenses, certificates of origins. Think about export licenses and whenever in doubt, escalate. So there we are. 
Um, it's a difficult subject to do justice to in 30 minutes, but I hope I've given you some core tips as to what um, you need to be thinking about, and need to be looking out for. So um, I, I still don't have any questions. That's absolutely fine. You don't have to ask me any questions, but I will, uh, if there are no questions, I will formally end this. Thank you for your attention. Uh, please remember that uh, training is a big part of this. I'm not just saying that because I'm a trainer, it really is. Um, and do the very best of luck with managing your own trade-based money laundering risk. Thanks all of you. So I'll leave you go. Oh, I have one question. Oh, goody. When it's a third party, uh, Shweta, okay. When it's a third party like the manufacturer, how do you do CDD? Um, you can't do full CDD probably, but there are certain things you can do. Um, you can screen them, that's, that's absolutely fine. You can do some adverse media checks. Um, you can do um, some basic beneficial owner checks, basic, basic checks on the manufacturer who owns it. That's often easy enough to find out. If the uh, manufacturer is important enough to the transaction, then actually I would go back to the seller and say, uh, we need to be introduced to the manufacturer and because we need to include them in this, they're clearly part of it. The time when that is most likely, Shweta, is when you have a standby letter of credit. Um, and that might be a revolving, there might be default obligations there if the seller doesn't pay the manufacturer. Yeah, that kind of thing might bring it in, but you, you won't be able to do full CDD generally, but you can do other things, as I said, sanction screening, um, open source checking, um, beneficial ownership checking, that kind of thing. So I hope that helps. Black market peso model is not, not seen only in Latin America, no. Um, it's, uh, it's a model that's a global model. And it's, it's simply a model that allows the movement of um, goods around. It'd be quite right, it's more common in Latin America. And there are lots of examples. There's been toy shops involved, there've been fashion shops involved. Um, there have been gold ingots involved. Um, so it's been particularly popular there. It actually started out in Colombia in the early 1980s, long before it was used for trade-based money laundering, it was more to do with um, actually helping simple Colombian businessmen get pesos back, which they couldn't get. So Latin America is very common. It's very common where you'll see it, but a lot of these models are global now. So um, a lot of global organized criminal gangs want to move things around. Did you? That's interesting. Um, yes, you will. Yeah, India. India, of course, has the merchanting uh, system, which which does tend to get uh, improve that as well. Thank you. That's really useful. How can we control multiple invoicing? Well, the things you start looking out for, Thomas, are um, the same goods coming through more than once, exactly the same, uh, same amount, same type. Uh, look for sequential invoice numbers. I've seen that's a mistake people make sometimes. They they keep issuing invoices for the same thing, but they you because of the way they generate it, they might actually print them all. Um, the, it, with different banks, uh, very difficult, very difficult. And that, that's actually something they're quite smart at doing. You know, trade-based money launderers who are very smart um, will often do it through different banks. And then frankly, the chances of spotting that is almost nil. Bear in mind, Thomas, that we can only spot what we can spot, but we're not gonna see everything. And it's almost axiomatic that the uh, trade-based money laundering typologies that we know about are the ones we caught. So there are plenty, I'm afraid, that do get through. So if someone's smart enough, they, they issue multiple invoices, they don't use sequential numbers, they use multiple banks, it's extremely difficult to detect, I'm afraid. So that seems to be all our questions. Thank you very much for that, great questions, and I wish you a good afternoon. Thank you, Heber.